we're just going to talk about archives and ephemeral as collection types. And archives are kind of cool things, and ephemera are even cooler because you don't think they're all that important until, say, 50, 100 years down the road. It tells you a lot about uh, cultural history. Ephemeral material is the kind of material that if you don't collect it, it tends to disappear. So it's things like broadsides, uh, flyers, leaflets, brochures, pamphlets. You know, some of the, the, the more well-known stuff would be like posters revolving around protests. But ephemeral material now also includes things like tweets. Those are just as important to capture for archives to learn about those aspects of cultural history that don't necessarily get put into books and formalized publications that we tend to see in, in archival collections. So not only the nature of the material itself, the fact that it's kind of transient, not meant to be permanent, the, the kinds of things that we would never really think too much about collecting unless you're in that mindset. And archi archivists are great at being in that kind of mindset. Okay, let's, going, let's get going with the wonderful world of archives. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to look at things a little bit more generally. And I'm going to talk about, I guess, what you would call best practices in terms of how to handle archival collections, especially if you're going into a setting where there's no documentation, there's no policies or procedures set up. In fact, your organization hasn't even recognized this material as potentially being archival material. And some of the best cases I can think of that illustrate this are local history collections that you might find in a public library, records that you find in a corporation, and even rare materials that are in collections, in regular collections, but you don't even realize you have these, these kinds of materials. Often we suddenly have in archives when somebody decides to donate a substantial collection of material. We find that we didn't necessarily have a formal archives before, but we're going to be getting 2,500 linear feet of stuff. Is it appropriate for us to take it? Do we have the facilities? Do we have the resources to be able to take on a collection like that? Can we build on resources we already have? So um, we're just going to talk about some of those things tonight. We have to look at the nature of the information itself in terms of what it consists of, what kind of information is it, and this also includes the relationship of the content of that material to its format. Is it something that we have in different formats? Or is this a new format, new content, everything? Everything about it is new. And is that content and format appropriate to the collection we have? We also need to think about access considerations. As you'll see with archives, uh, you just don't let people wander through your stacks. That's how things disappear and end up on eBay or Amazon Marketplace, or you know the local antiques mall. In the beginning days of eBay, this was a huge concern, because people weren't just taking books, rare books, out of archives. They were slicing out things like maps, slicing out illustrations, and then you'd find a single illustration on eBay, a single map up on eBay. And people were making a lot of money off of this kind of thing. So we need um, to balance access with security. So we'll talk about some of the issues with that. Obviously storage and preservation issues which are related to access security but also content. Remember we have to consider all of this in terms of the nature of our users. Who are they? What do we know about their needs and their expectations? If you have an archive, who are the people who come in and use your collection? who could potentially come in and use your collection, and what are their expectations for that kind of material. And then how can we learn more about them once we figure out who they are? Uh, you've already practiced one way of learning about users with your user needs analysis, but there are a multitude of different ways that we can learn about users. We can talk to them, <laughs> you know, being personable, interpersonal communication. <laughs> We have to consider the nature of our organization. What are our priorities? What is our reason for existing? What are our mission goals and objectives? What are our values? And how does this potential collection fit into those values? Often archives are part of a larger organization. 
Very rarely do you find them as standalone places. An exception would be like the Internet Archive. That is kind of a standalone uh, organization, a standalone collection. But archives are usually part of a library or a university or, an, or a corporation or a law firm or a television station. I mean, there's so many places wherever there is an organization as a whole, you can have some sort of archive. And there's the potential for creating an archive. So since you are part of a, another organization, a larger organization, how does your archives fit within the mission goals and priorities of those organizations, the parent body? What kind of information do you already have in your collections? And is this new format, this new content, going to fit in with that? And then, of course, your infrastructure. Do you have the space for 2,500 linear feet of archival materials? Archival materials are usually measured in linear feet, not necessarily numbers of items, because you could have a book. You could also have you know, 500 sheets, individual sheets of paper from 500 different individual documents. I mean, and you can have just about anything from physical artifacts to documents to photographs and all sorts of different media and archives, as we'll see when we look at a few. So do you have the infrastructure to basically store and preserve those kinds of materials? More and more, you're seeing digital archives. You're seeing digitizing of existing materials in archives. But you're also seeing archives springing up to collect uh, and provide access to born digital, digital objects. Do you have the IT support for that? You can't just you know, throw things up on the web and not have any organization to it, not have any security, not have any backup, not have any uh, ways of properly storing and format migration for those materials. So it's a lot that you've got to think about. We're going to focus on in this lecture and with the remaining lectures on this part, the nature of the information with regard to the format. So here's an example of an archive that I thought was pretty cool, the Grateful Dead Archive at UC Santa Cruz. And just about every archive, when you find their web presence, they're going to have a little information about the collection or about the archive, a little historical background on it. And if you were to go the, to this website for the Grateful Dead Archive, at the references at the end of these slides, I have URLs for those, but you can also just Google Grateful Dead Archive, uh, you'll find this statement of, what the collection is about. And you'll find that this archive contains show files of tours and concerts with posters, photographs, tickets, backstage passes, laminates documenting the, ba the band's recordings and performances, merchandise samples, stage backdrops, instruments, and even, even recording equipment. So, you know, that's a pretty sizable <laughs> collection. And it was actually donated by the band to UC Santa Cruz. We go into the Art Institute of Chicago, and we find that this archives has artists and architect papers, a wide range of media, including correspondence, published and unpublished writings, scrapbooks, drawings, architectural drawings and prints, business papers, photographs, slides, audio recordings, films, video, and ephemera. It's funny, within this archives format, we have a gazillion different kinds of formats. So archives are kind of a catch-all for everything. Anything and everything could be in there. Mark Twain papers and projects. Uh, this is at uh, Berkeley. And this is basically the private papers of Mark Twain. What they've done is they've added on to the original collection over time. And they've been able to acquire letters, manuscripts, scrapbooks. Scrapbooks are huge in libraries and local history collections. First editions and other rare printings. So Mark Twain's library, because one of the things that's interesting about Mark Twain, if you do any research on him, is he wrote incessantly in the margins of books he was reading. And he made commentary on this, these books through this marginalia. And there's a whole discipline based on Mark Twain's marginalia. And you learned what he thought about politics and religion. And so it wasn't just in his writings but also in the little scribbles that he made in the books that he owned. So his private library, which included first editions and other rare printings, as well as photographs, various important collateral documents, such as the diary of his secretary, 
So again, you can find all sorts of different kinds of formats within archives and ephemeral materials in general. With that in mind, how do we go about acquiring materials for a collection like this? How do you know what to get? <laughs> Who to collect? How to go about getting it? So there are different ways that we can do this. Usually archives start out as a kind of foundation collection. They're the archives of an organization, the archives of a university. And their job is to collect the history and writings and materials related to that organization. So you find most universities have archives. Large public libraries might have archives, but organizations, uh, corporations also have archives if they're smart and they retain that kind of information. Some corporations don't think it's important to retain that, that information, but, but it, we find that it is. It's, it's a wonderful resource for looking at the history and development of an organization over time. And especially as you find today with all of these corporate mergers and then splits and then corporations going defunct, how do you retain that history? It's usually in these foundation collections. The biggest management issue with collections like this is not so much acquiring it, but one of the biggest issues is trying to keep a collection like this intact, especially if you're in a company and that company gets bought up by another company. How do you keep the archives of the original company intact um, without you know, the new company coming in and saying, those are the old days. Get rid of all that. We're now such and such a company. We don't want to live in the past. Well, OK, maybe your new company won't allow you to keep all that stuff. So what might you do with it? You're just going to ditch it? Is there another organization that would be willing to take it on? Maybe a local history a museum or a local public library if they have the resources for it. Sometimes you have no choice but to ditch it because you, know, you have no control over it and obviously the priorities of the new corporation take precedence. But a lot of really, really valuable historical information is lost when that happens. So foundation collections, this is one way that you can acquire materials for an archives. You can also um, receive them through donation or what we call depositing, depositing things into an archives. And a lot of the materials that you find in archives are acquired through the goodness of donors. The donors may have a long time connection with your archive or with your institution, or they may just be, you know, somebody's daughter is cleaning out their grandfather's stuff and see that it's potentially historically significant and ask the archivist with the uh, local public library to come down and take a look at it and see if it's stuff that, that might be worth hanging on to. Donors might be individual people or they might be organizations. The Diocese of Buffalo, I think they have their own archives, but if not that the Diocese of Buffalo would ever pull out of Buffalo, but if they were going to, it might be worth it for them to deposit their materials at one of the local uh, organizations um, like the History Museum or the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library or even you know, the UB archives. You can get entire collections at a time and sometimes you can get individual pieces. The UB archives has a, a couple, I think it's got a couple of boxes of materials related to the Pan American Exposition. And there's a whole lot of tchotchke re related to that World's Fair. And some people are huge collectors, and some people decided to donate their collection to the UB archives back in 2001, which was the 100th anniversary. W what I found interesting about that was people just coming forward. And this is a light bulb that was in one of the buildings. Now, this was 1901, one of the first fully electrified fairs, power from Niagara Falls. So it was historically significant for a number of reasons. And she had one of the light bulbs. And we're like, well, can you prove it's one of the light bulbs? And she had a letter. Her great, great, great aunt, who was a bit of a rabble rouser in 1901, went and stole it from one of the buildings when she was visiting the fair. So that was just an item, but it, it was interesting kinds of material that would fit in with that kind of collection. Then there are people who give 
whole collection of stuff. I think we had Jack Kemp's papers over there. Um, Congressman Jack Kemp was also a football pa player for the Buffalo Bills. But that was a whole collection of stuff. Now keep in mind, when you have to make the decision whether to take on a collection, what are you going to think about? And the size of the collection, what's contained within it. Are there any special media that you would have to account for? Uh, and of course this. <laughs> Somebody is maybe very, very happy to donate their collection to you. Doesn't necessarily mean that you want it, because it may not be appropriate. Or you know how people are, what, what's precious to some people is not so much to others. And they want to donate their own personal library. Well, their personal library consists of materials that exist in thousands of other libraries throughout the world. Of course, we can always go out and purchase materials. And we do this to build on and enhance uh, the collections that we already have. And we do this through traditional acquisition methods, which are to use booksellers. But in archives, you tend to be working with more specialized material. So really, the sources that you turn to, especially individual booksellers, often when they find out what you're looking for, They'll keep an eye out and let you know when something becomes available. When you do make purchases, besides building on the collection you have, you've got to make sure those purchases still fill, fit in with your, your collecting priorities. And all archives should have their own kind of collection development policy, even if they exist within another library. Because they're usually collecting very, very specific stuff. And they usually don't have a whole lot of money to spend. And the money that they do have comes through grants and endowments. So there may be specific things that they can use grant money for or use an endowment for. They can't just go purchase anything with it. So having a collection development policy that sets those priorities gives you a guide for when you do have an opportunity to purchase things. Auctions are another place that we find materials that end up in archives. I had mentioned about building relationships with the sources that we acquire materials for, but also you have to be aware of any special legal restrictions. For instance, in the UK, there are certain kinds of materials that cannot be exported from the UK. Things relating to estates, uh, manor records, you have to be aware of the limitations that may exist in the place you're trying to acquire the materials from. But you also may need to be aware of limitations on the kinds of materials that you can purchase. For instance, in many countries, you cannot uh, purchase anything having to do with the Nazi party, uh, in, in certain countries in Europe, especially Germany. If you have memorabilia related to the Nazi party, and then somebody from Germany contacts you wanting to purchase some of this material, you have to be aware that it's illegal to purchase and to sell that kind of material in Germany. Okay, so legal restrictions on buying and selling certain kinds of materials, but then ethical responsibilities with things related to archives and really things related to all library collections. You shouldn't be acquiring materials that are going to give somebody some sort of monetary benefit. So you have to be very careful in how you go about purchasing some materials. Uh, very common with archives are internal transfers, like archives of a corporation. When somebody leaves or retires, the working papers of that person go to the archives. Or once a year, the working papers, all the various departments throughout the corporation will go to the archives. Any proprietary information will go to the archives. You want to make sure you, that you have written and authorized policies and procedures in place for this internal transfer of documents so that material can be de uh, deposited from other departments into the archives. And you want that in writing. And you want to make sure that the rest of the organization is aware of this. Sometimes during other activities, let's say in archives that exist within an academic library, during weeding activities, we come across some very fragile materials, some historically significant or rare materials, some valuable materials. 
We may come across those in our general collection and decide that those are going to be moved into our archives. That is an internal transfer. And still, as with everything else that you accession into your archives, you need to make sure that it's appropriate to the collection. It might be rare and it might be fragile, but it still may not be appropriate to the collection. You may, may need to say, you know what, we'll take it for now just because we have more security than the open stacks, but be aware that this really isn't appropriate to our collection, so we will eventually need to make other arrangements for it. The ultimate decisions on whether or not to approve any transfer still lie with the head of the archives. The head of the archives ultimately says yes or no, we will take this collection or we will not. Or if it's not necessarily a head, it could be a board that runs the archives. All too often, archives are looked upon as a dumping ground for the stuff that you don't know what else to do with, and they shouldn't be. Then, of course, we have proactive collecting. And this is what we do with ephemera collections. This is one of the more fun aspects of being in special collections. It's important with artifacts that are re, uh, related to popular culture, materials that would disappear if somebody didn't actually proactively go out and collect them. I want to show you a couple of these examples so you can see. These are just three that I found, but there are tons of ephemeral collections around. This is the Broadsides and Ephemera collection at Duke. Now this happens to be a digital collection. They've, they've digitized the broadsides that they've collected throughout US history and made them available on, in this digital library. But these are all actual pieces, actual artifacts, broadsides that they have in their collections. And of course, in the 19th century America, how did you communicate with people? There weren't a lot of newspapers. And there certainly, in smaller, more remote areas, weren't newspapers. You didn't have telephones. Letters took a long time. You would communicate events by putting posters, or what we call broadsides, up. Any type of election, tack it up on a pole rather than mail it to you. Another broadside collection is the Vietnam War ephemera collection at the University of Washington. And this has, here's an example of a, a student magazine, a student uh, publication. But there's also any of the flyers that would be announcing a protest or a sit-in or, or something going on. At least somebody there had the wherewithal to collect all this stuff, realizing that, the, you know, this is a significant event. And then even your local history societies can have ephemera collections. And I'd be willing to bet that a lot of historical societies run by the 90-year-old volunteer who's been doing it for the entire existence of the historical society have these kinds of collections, but because they're not necessarily trained in this, they don't know really what they have and how important it is. Here are the kinds of things that you will find in the ephemera series. The other problem with broadsides and ephemeral material is it's not necessarily dated. You don't know necessarily who created it. It's fugitive type material. And often, unless it's apparent in the content, it's difficult to really place the source and the, the, the provenance and the, um, the creator and sometimes even the aboutness of it. But these are just three sample collections. Obviously, the Grateful Dead archive is going to have a whole lot of uh, ephemeral material in it, things like broadsides. And what's interesting about this archive is a lot of the information in here has been crowdsourced. So in addition to the donation that the band made to this archive, a lot of additional material has been donated by the Deadhead community. But also, history of that material. They use uh, crowdsourcing and technology to place things up online to have people look at it and tell us what this is all about. Where did this come from? And this crowdsourcing has, been a has enabled them to identify a lot of stuff locally produced that they would not have known about otherwise. 
You know, that's the problem with coming in and processing an ephemeral collection after the fact. You have to guess. But here you've got people who you know, spent the majority of their adult lives as deadheads, and they know a lot about this material, and they're very happy to come in and share with you more than you could ever want to know about some of it. But it's a great example of getting community involved in your archive, and because you got them involved in something that they're passionate about, they decide to give you a whole lot of money one day. And that doesn't mean you do all, you know, I mentioned money. It doesn't mean you do all of this just because you might get money from them. But it's, again, it's a way of building relationships. Because if this archive was to ever come under threat from uh, higher powers that be, that we're no longer going to provide any kind of funding, then you have a whole community, all these people who participated in the crowdsourcing activities, they're going to be huge advocates. Interesting stuff in there, though. This is, a, yeah, here, fan art. If you didn't involve the deadhead community, how could you possibly collect this kind of material? So proactive collecting. And often the people who do this proactive collecting, you know, going around and collecting ephemeral materials, broadsides, leaflets, um, they may be volunteers, they may be student assistants, people who are coming in to learn about archives and the importance of what to collect and what you can leave alone. Also falling under proactive collecting is oral histories. NPR has a, what is it, it's a story project where they're interviewing people of all different ages from all different walks of life, just about general things. And it's part of a larger grant-funded project, but those oral histories need to be collected and stored somewhere, right? You know, they've done some wonderful oral history collections of World War II veterans. You don't see as much of it with World War I veterans, and unfortunately, they're all gone now. When you're, when you're collecting these oral histories, you also have to think about, all right, yes, we can proactively collect them, but how are we going to make them accessible? I had the opportunity to take a look at some software that one of the students in history was developing. He also took an ind indexing class uh, in our department for indexing oral histories. It is going through the actual audio files and putting marks in them with tags, with indexed terms, so that when you're looking, let's say you're looking through a collection of oral histories of World War II veterans and you want to find recollections of men who served in a, in a particular uh, marine squadron at Guadalcanal. Not only would it take you to the oral histories of individual people, but it would actually take you to the point in their recording where they begin to talk about that, which is an enormous time saver if you're a person who's you know, doing comprehensive research on these kinds, uh, these kinds of topics. So we can collect these oral histories. That's really the easy part. How do we then make them accessible to people who need them? Do we have that capability? Or do we need to potentially bring in someone else who has that kind of expertise? Digital collections. We have a lot of material in archives that we select to digitize and put up online. But more and more, you're finding organizations that are collecting born digital objects. So as I said, things related to the Occupy movement, you've got an abundance of physical materials related to that, but you've also got all sorts of digital objects, whether it be digital photos, websites that were created, you've got blogs that were created, you've got collections of Twitter feeds, Facebook presence, you know, again, how can you collect all of this material? And then, once you get it all collected, how do you organize it and make it accessible? Okay? And then, as I mentioned with the Grateful Dead Archive, crowdsourcing. Bringing in volunteers to help with some of these collections. Um, crowdsourcing is also used for translation of materials. You're a small historical society, and you have a lot of ethnic materials that are in the original language, but you don't have the expertise for translating them. You can get the community, you can get the digital community, the online community involved in that translation through crowdsourcing. And there are a lot of activities going on right now with manuscripts and letters and, 
And it's really interesting how we can use new technologies to help us navigate through old stuff. You know, it's a way of really kind of marrying the two that's been very successful. Now, I had mentioned the importance of documentation, and I'm going to reiterate it here. I don't have any examples of documents, but there are some components of documentation that are important. You want to make sure the documentation shows a transfer of ownership for the materials that you're taking on. And if it's anything other than a clear transfer of ownership and copyright, you need to make sure the details of that are noted in the documentation. An example, the archives has ownership of the collection, but the widow of, of the gentleman who produced these papers still retains the copyright. Okay? That needs to be spelled out in your documentation. You need to record details of the donor, especially contact information. And also that means setting up some sort of schedule for contacting those donors to ensure that that contact information is still current. Has that donor passed away? If that donor has passed away, then there are new things you need to deal with with regard to that documentation. Hopefully you've written into the documentation what happens to that material, to the copyright, to the ownership, should the donor pass away, but sometimes we don't, you know, we don't foresee that, especially if it's a relatively young person who's uh, donating. As part of this documentation, describe the material. Identify it. What is it? How much of it is there? How did you get it? What is the provenance that you know of? And you want to get that from the donor while they're alive, because it's awfully hard to get it from them when they're dead. And you don't want to have to come back to this later on. Quantities of materials, any kind of references related to the materials, naming the collection. Oh, make sure that the donor gives you the OK on the naming of the collection, because it can be a very, very touchy subject. And then in this documentation, you want to basically outline what you're going to be doing with the material. Do you have the right to dispose of it or to offer it to another archive or to another collection? Often there will be a clause in there, nothing will be discarded or sold without permission from the donor. Sometimes uh, you'll see clauses saying that you know, the final disposition is left with the judgment of the library. And the, the documentation basically states that the owner is transferring all rights, responsibilities related to ownership, copyright, the whole thing, to the library or to the archive. And they really, from then on, would have nothing to do with it. That's what you find with most donations. But things that tend to be valuable, historically significant, um, they can get a, a little bit more complex. But of course, the, the important point here is that you want to get all this in writing. Okay, and you want to make sure that you're on the same page as the donor because you don't want to jeopardize that relationship. And some materials are such that you even want to get legal counsel involved because some things are extremely valuable, extremely rare, one of a kind, extremely significant. In cases like that, having an attorney draw up the paperwork and handle the legalities of the transfer of ownership and or copyright uh, is, is really to your benefit. As I mentioned, issues of weeding and deselection, you want to make sure that that's somehow mentioned. You also want to address any copyright issues, especially if the owner decides to retain the copyright. Even though the owner retains the copyright, can the archives use this material for promotional purposes? Can it use this material for advertising purposes? We're going to have an exhibit on this collection. So can we make a few dig low resolution digital copies of some of the materials to put up on our website or to use on the, the flyers and posters that we're going to be putting on campus? Often you can do that. The copyright owner might actually license the archive to use the material for educational purposes. We talked about licenses with online materials, but we might have to actually get licenses to use materials that we technically own if we want to you know, do so in a manner that doesn't have to involve um, compensating the copyright owner in some way. And then, of course, you want to address a possible worst case. What will happen to the collection 
if the archive ceases to exist. It's not likely that that'll happen, but what if it does? Some language might be the, the collection will be offered to be returned to the donor, or the collection may be offered to another institution, or the collection's final disposition will rest with the donor. That's not a common thing, but with some materials, archives, especially smaller organizations, could be in situations where they just can't afford to keep this material. And by keeping it, it's actually doing the collection more harm than good. Or by keeping it, we're actually keeping people from accessing it, where if we transfer it to a larger organization that's very happy to take it, then it would actually be used. It would be useful. They, they have the, the personnel, they have the expertise to digitize some of these materials or to um, take care of any preservation issues there might be. I mentioned that they often have an accession record or it's an accession folder. Usually keep a paper backup. But the accession record contains all of the documentation, all of the evidence of the legal transfer of ownership or legal transfer of copyright. This is a little different than what you find in other areas of a library. Our acquisition record consists of basically a purchase order. And that's all we have is a purchase order to show that we now have ownership of the object that we just purchased. But archival materials are a lot different. So obviously this, um, this accession record or acquisition record is an important piece of document and adds to the, the chain of ownership. It adds to our ability to keep track of the chain of ownership because usually as part of this accession record is information on the provenance and how the donor came to acquire this material and how the person they acquired it from came to acquire it. It's interesting the ways in which we acquired the Ulysses manuscript. It was part of a lot of material that was being smuggled out of Europe during World War II. And um, a lot of the materials in the um, rare books collection are compliments of Thomas Lockwood, who was a, a very avid book collector. So understanding how he acquired the material, keeping track of all that is just as important to the, the value of the, the material as actually acquiring it. And of course, just as you should have backups of any kinds of records in your organization, you definitely want backups of your accession records. Now, when we're thinking about providing access to archival collections, as I mentioned earlier, we want to find a balance between providing access, so our public, our users can actually use the material, but also providing for the security of that material. So rarely, in fact, I don't know of any archives where a patron is actually allowed to browse the stacks. Usually, um, archival materials are in closed stack areas. Sometimes they're in compact storage, which means the public legally cannot access those collections because, number one, they're not ADA compliant, and number two, in terms of fire safety and the fact that the compact storage, you know, there's a lot of ways in which people can get hurt. So you don't want the public to have access to your stacks. Most importantly, you just, for security of the materials themselves, especially one-of-a-kind type objects, you certainly don't want people just going in and pulling out materials, potentially stealing them. But also, could you imagine in an archives if somebody was to misshelve something? You wouldn't find it for generations. They put it in a wrong box. Uh, you know, it's a single leaf of paper. They stick it in a wrong box. Good luck finding that. So it's for the security of the collection, but also organization. You want to limit how much a person, now if you're familiar with archives, usually you go into an archive, you sign in somewhere. You may have to produce ID to show who you are. And you, you are shown as being in the archives for a particular time period. You want to make sure that you have procedures in place that will tie individual items to people. So if something happens with that item, suddenly pages are missing, we know that that item was in the possession of so-and-so between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock on November 3rd. And you can potentially then try to find out what happened. So developing these kinds of procedures 
developing policies for what people can bring in to the reading room. No pens, pencils only. They may not allow you to take book bags in. Obviously no food. And they may limit the number of items that you can have at any one time, in part because people are going to watch you while you're in the reading room. In our archives, there are certain areas where you can sit when you're working with materials. And basically, it's to place you in the view of whoever is attending the reading room so they can make sure you're not razoring out pictures or defacing things or doing otherwise nasty and dastardly deeds to our collections. But it's also to make sure that that material is not stuffed into a book bag or down into a pocket. Because you usually don't have tattle tapes in archival materials. You usually don't have spine labels. You usually don't have any kind of security measures other than the fact that they are only passed out by archival staff to users and can only be used in that reading room. Okay? Besides these policies, making sure your staff understand the policies and that they're well trained and motivated to care about these materials. There are some materials that users may not be able to have access to at all. One, one example that comes to mind here is the U Ulysses manuscript. And that's partially for preservation purposes, partially because of the value of it. But what they did to get around that in terms of providing people access was they digitized it. And they make a digital version of it available in the reading room on a computer, specific computer there because the Joyce Foundation, that was what they would allow us to do. We couldn't just stick it up online. And what that does is it preserves the original, but it still provides scholars with access to the original. You have to think about storage, secure closed stacks. Of course, this means that you're going to require more staff, right? Because staff are going to have to get user requests, go back, retrieve the items, and bring them back. It's not like you can just set users loose like you can in a, in a regular library in OpenStax and they can go get what they want and they can browse. You may need special storage for different kinds of media. What if you have original paintings? What if you're a, you know, an archive attached to a museum and you might have actual works of art? You're going to need certain kinds of materials to protect those while they're in storage. Do you have a large collection of oral histories on reel-to-reel -reel tape? You don't have any kind of money to, re to pay to have them reformatted to DVD or to digital format. You're going to have to maintain at least one reel-to-reel -reel tape player so a person can use the collection. Of course, we run into other risks when we're talking about media like that because magnetic tape has a life of about 75 years before it sticks to itself and often will have one good play left in it. So you may have to choose some collections you're not going to provide any kind of access to until you can digitally reform it, because they've only got one play left in them. Um, the tape is going to break. It's going to snap. It's starting to deteriorate. And we want to capture as much as we can off of it when we reformat it. If we let anyone else use it before then, then we run the risk of getting nothing off of it. OK, so knowing the condition of your collections, is going to help to determine whether you're going to make those collections accessible or not. There's a possibility you might have to go with off-site storage. So when you're looking for off-site storage facilities, you need to make sure that they can provide for any special requirements that you would have needed if they were on-site storage. Environmental controls, special enclosures for different kinds of media. Although we've talked primarily about physical formats, more and more archives are getting into digitizing. So we have to think about our IT capacity and the expertise that we have available for any digital collections that we want to create. Or if we're going to archive born digital collections, again, do we have the IT capacity to not only store those and preserve those digital files, but make them accessible? Because it's one thing to store them on a server. That's real easy to do. But how are you going to make them accessible for users? With the kinds of materials you're talking about collecting, do they need any kind of special preservation treatment? Are they covered with pigeon poop? And you laugh, but we did have a collection come in that was covered with pigeon poop. You know, pigeons carry a lot of disease. So it's really just more than just the grossness factor. 
is that material going to be able to be cleaned? Um, does the material have worms in it and bugs? Has it got leather rot? Is it brittle? You know, the condition of the material, is it going to require specialized preservation activities to stabilize the material? Is it going to require conservation activities to restore the material? How important is the content? Can you get away with stabilizing it so it doesn't get any worse? That's what preservation departments do. Or is it something that actually has to go to a conservator? That is, deacidifying a book, um, which can be done, but it is pretty costly and time consuming. So you're not going to be deacidifying de every brittle book in your, in your archive. You may instead decide to reformat it and make the reformatted copy available for your users while retaining the original copy in your collection. One would be called a service copy as opposed to the archival copy. Can you provide for not only environmental controls but fire suppression systems? Physical archives tend to be heavily paper-based. Halon suppression systems Basically, they preserve the paper by pushing all of the oxygen out of the room to suppress the fire. Because water damage is just as bad as fire damage when it comes to paper-based materials. Okay, can you afford a hell-on suppression system? Do you have policies in place for preserving those materials during use? If you've ever dealt with some archival collections or gone down to the History Museum to look at photographs, you've got to put on the white gloves. Uh, basically, they don't want the oils from your hands getting onto these materials because they will degrade the materials. You're seeing more and more use of digital surrogates for access, digital versions of something that you have in a physical copy, again, to preserve the original. And of course, as part of any of your preservation activities, you want to have some policies in place for backing up uh, any digital archival materials that you have. Now to give you an idea of the kinds of preservation materials we use for stabilizing print materials, they're not cheap. Oversized folders, you get 10 for $13. And that may not seem like a lot, but think of how many oversized folders you might need in an archives uh, that has photographs. CDs, a 10-pack of sleeves for $12.19, large uh, map and print folders, five pack for $78.95. These are the boxes you see most often in archives. These are legal size ar ar archival document cases. And by archival, they mean they've, um, they're pH balanced, they're acid free, they're not going to contribute to the deterioration of any kind of paper materials that are put in them. $8.65 each. Next time you're in an archival collection, just count how many of those boxes are in one row. Glue-in shelf binders, so taking paperback pamphlets and placing them in protective binders to keep them from deteriorating. And then polyester sleeves for pamphlets. You see a lot of these used with photographs as well. Some are actually UV protected, but with most archival materials, they're not really put out in the light. <laughs> And even when they are put out in the light, quite often the display cases have special kinds of bulbs so that the light isn't damaging like um, fluorescent lights. You know, if you ever notice, turn white paper yellow over time. Very damaging to physical material. These are just some samples. Gaylord is a company here in, in New York State that is one of the major providers of archival enclosures and preservation materials. You know, take a look in their online catalog. They have everything from uh, this kind of stuff to boxes that would hold swords and conservation materials and, and preservation materials, special kinds of glue, special kinds of tape, special kind of binding board. And, um, but again, this stuff can get very expensive. And so as part of your infrastructure, do you have the resources, the money to be able to invest in these kinds of enclosures that are going to allow you to preserve that archives, or at the very least, stabilize it so it doesn't degrade or deteriorate anymore. Okay, um, the references are on the end of the slide. I will put these slides up uh, on UB Learns for you. Otherwise, have a great week.